Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlotte Adams, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon to talk about the potential of geothermal in the UK, focused around learnings from the, U from the North East. So this live webinar is part of Net Zero Week 2024, which is the UK's official National Awareness Week. And there's lots of exciting stuff going on throughout the week, so you can still get free tickets for more online events at their website, www.netzeroweek.com. I'm delighted to be on the panel this afternoon with Mark, Belinda and Chris, and we'll all introduce ourselves fully to you shortly. Um, but these guys are going to talk to you about the amazing work they've been doing promoting geothermal, particularly in the Northeast, alongside other people um, and also Lizzie and her team at the Northeast Combined Authority. So thank you very much for listening. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions through the chat. If you see a question that's been asked, that's something you want to ask, you can vote for it as well, which will push it further up the list. So please do that if you're going to ask something similar to what someone's already asked already. I'll start with um, an introduction to myself. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So I'm Charles Adams. I'm a hydrogeologist with 20 years experience in geothermal, working across public and private and commercial sectors. And I joined the National Geothermal Centre three months ago. It's a new entity, entity and I'll tell you a little bit more about it shortly, but I'm very excited about the potential it holds and the potential for supercharging UK geothermal. The UK has a wide range of geothermal resources available in most places and also within legacy fossil fuel in infrastructure where some of the work has already been done for us and you'll hear a little bit more about that shortly. But to give you a bit of context, we've obviously experienced an energy crisis recently with increased fuel prices. We've also got um, obligations to meet net zero targets and we're also now becoming increasingly reply reliant on energy imports. The decarbonisation of heat remains a huge challenge, but hopefully after the pre presentations you'll hear today, you'll realise that it's really well aligned with what geothermal has to offer. And to add value to this, we can also use it for heating and cooling and also storage. And we look forward to seeing the first geothermal electricity produced in Cornwall towards the end of the year. And we've shown at several places across the UK, at Southampton and in Cornwall, and particularly in the North East, which you'll hear about shortly, that it can be done, but we just need more of it. And that's what we'd like to achieve. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So our mission is to release the UK's untapped geothermal potential. And our vision is to make geothermal a key contributor to the UK's future low carbon energy mix. In terms of the National Geothermal Centre, we are, a, as the name suggests, we are a national entity. We've been established through a collaboration between Durham University with funding from the Rees Foundation, Shift Geothermal, which is a not-for-profit company, and the Net Zero Technology Centre, which has also provided some startup funding to the centre. We're currently not a membership organisation. We began um, operating in January and I joined the company three months ago. And presently we have office space within some of our partner members, our founding members, but we're a virtual centre at the moment. And we'd like to have um, a main centre ultimately, but then with regional centres of excellence on particular spe specialisms relating to geothermal. And obviously, with the work that's going on in the northeast on both deep and shallow geothermal, 
it's um, a prime example of what we would like to see to coalesce to form a, a regional centre of excellence. We'd like to become a through funder eventually, so we want to seek funding that will enable us to then pass funding on to others to do things like research calls, technology calls, um, work on policy documents. So that's what we'd like to do ultimately. Next slide, please. In terms of what the organisation is and, and our core values, we're independent and impartial, and that's to encourage collaboration. And we want to have the flexibility to speak and act on behalf of the people we're working with and all our stakeholders across the industry to provide a singular voice for geothermal, which ge geothermal hasn't really had over the years. And we do face um, some strong lobbying in other energy areas. So for us to have the centre and be able to act collectively, I think will be very powerful for geothermal developments in future. We want to be inclusive, so we want to include everybody working across the sector for all types of geothermal, because obviously there's many different types of geothermal that you could have from shallower geothermal to deep geothermal. We'll hear some examples this afternoon. We want to be collaborative. We're aware that lots and lots of great work's gone on already, and particularly in the northeast. And we want to avoid duplicating that work, but we want to fill gaps. Um, or talk to people who develop projects and things they've maybe found challenging or would do differently. So to share that knowledge and to address any issues um, that they've found so that other people can develop geothermal projects more smoothly in future. We'd also like to support businesses and their supply chains that are looking to transition um, from more fossil fuel energy production towards geothermal production as well. So we see a role in supporting that transition. We want to be authoritative, so we want to find, have a central place where people can go to for information. And there's lots of good stuff out there at the moment. Um, and sometimes people don't know exactly where to look for it. So we'd like to have a role where we provide links to all this information and signpost to it. And ultimately, we'll be putting our own information out there too, in the form of kind of joint documents and, and papers that we're producing in collaboration with all our stakeholder members. Next slide, please. So we have um, four priority areas where we believe that we can help. And this is based on talking to our stakeholders in terms of the types of issues they would like to talk to us about and kind of grouping them together. So in terms of policy and regulation for geothermal, it uses existing regulation, which is kind of designed more around water abstractions. And so we want to decide on what needs regulating. We certainly don't want to over-regulate an embryonic market to stifle its growth. And we also want to learn from abroad. So there's other nations with similar geothermal resources to the UK, and we want to learn what they've done and how have they succeeded and learn from that success. Next point, please. So technology and innovation, we'd love to establish some research and industry collaborations to support innovation right through from somebody coming up with an idea to deploying it as part of a geothermal system. And that's something we'd like to do if we're successful in becoming a, three, a through funder. And then we could offer technology calls for initial feasibility right through to de deployment, demonstration and testing. Next point, please. So we'd like geothermal to be a key part of the future energy mix, but we realize it won't be the only part and it will require integrating geothermal and what it has to offer with other systems and other forms of infrastructure, so such as things like heat networks, or we may, we may want to combine it with other renewable energy sources or combine it with other opportunities such as things like waste heat. Next point, please. So we have a wide um, research community in the UK. Um, and we've got Mark talking to us lately, representing that in, in the northeast. And there's around about 20 UK universities who are doing geothermal research. And we want to kind of get an idea of what everybody's doing, make sure everyone else knows about what they're doing, particularly in industry, because they may have some um, things that they would like to be researched. And there's opportunities for collaboration, new groupings, new ideas and new work to be done. And there's also plenty of potential, again, to learn from abroad with some of the research going on there as well, and then disseminate that back to people in the UK. Next slide, please. So one of the first things we've been doing at the centre 
is to prepare a roadmap for where we see geothermal in 2050. And we see the pathway to getting to these points um, aligning under those four areas that I've just discussed with you. And for heat, based on, um, we'd like to see 10 gigawatts of heat by 2050, and that's based on an annual compound growth around about 10%, which is based on global average. We want to see an order of magnitude installed in geothermal heat. Um, so that's you know, over and above what we have now. And we'd also like to see electricity as part of our energy mix. The UK's geothermal resources is best suited to heat creation, but there are some sites in the UK where geothermal could produce electricity as well. And if we get that, that would give us around about 10 million tonnes of avoided carbon per year. And are these targets achievable? Yes, we believe they are. This aligns with um, other countries and particularly the EU vision for 250 gigawatts of geothermal installed by 2040, spread over the 27 EU states. And the Netherlands has had a 50% increase in its geothermal sector in the last five years. And that's because it has um, three key support measures. Um, they have in risk insurance for the drilling. They have um, financial incentives where you get a payment for for every kilowatt of hour of geothermal heat or electricity you produce, and there's access to data. The UK has access to data, but some of that might be a bit more piecemeal. We don't have the incentive or the insurance policies in place at the moment. So that's one example how we can learn from what another country has done and advocate for similar policy instruments or technical data to be available to allow this progress here. In terms of um, job creation, we believe that if this amount of geothermal is present in 2050, that would create around about 50,000 direct jobs um, in the supply and sale of geothermal energy. Opportunities exist for crossover and business diversification, and for example, for energy, cons energy companies, consultancies, drilling and exploration companies, and across the enti entire supply chains. Many businesses are considering geothermal to reduce their energy costs. And certainly there are multinational companies I know of are using that to keep them in the UK. And many have ambitious net zero targets, and you'll hear from one of those this afternoon, and can see new business opportunities for supplying products that have a lower carbon footprint. Next slide, please. So in our first few months of operation, we've been busy setting up the organisation. We're delighted to report that we launched successfully in June at Dynamic Earth. I've already mentioned the roadmap that we produced, and today we've presented some of the headline figures from that, but we'll be producing a document alongside that that sets out how we hope to get there over the next few years. We're looking for seed funding to keep us going in the meantime until we can prepare a larger bid to become a through funder. And we're also planning workshops under some of those four key areas that I showed you earlier. So if anybody out there is interested in getting involved, please do get in touch on our website. Next slide, please. So that's got some more information on um, about how you can contact us if you want to. Have a look on our website. Um, there's some FAQs and things on there as well. And we're just starting to populate it as well as we, as we grow. Um, but thank you very much for listening. And um, I'd be delighted now to hand over to Mark Island. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Charlotte, for that uh, wonderful introduction to the value that geothermal energy can, can bring the UK. Um, I'm Dr. Mark Island. I'm a senior lecturer in energy geoscience at Newcastle University. Uh, my uh, background is I'm a geologist. Um, my career spans both industry and academia. I've been at Newcastle University for five years, but prior to that, uh, I worked in the upstream oil and gas sector, so uh, for uh, almost a decade. Um, today, I'm going to build on some of the points that Charlotte's uh, already emphasised about the resource potential that we have uh, both here in the Northeast and, and across the, the rest of the UK. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. And uh, okay, so 
I sit in a university. Universities in the northeast are really important, particularly here in, in, in Newcastle, Newcastle University, Northumbria University, and then a number of other institutions uh, around the region all bring lots of uh, value to the economy uh, and also to increase our understanding of various subject areas. What I'm going to do today is highlight a few places where the experiments that maybe started off as part of a, a research project or a related to a university, uh, provide a catalyst for the exploration and the subsequent exploitation of geothermal energy. Uh, and this very much has a, a Northeast focus. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Charlotte's already given us a, a wonderful introduction to why geothermal energy could be so valuable in net zero pathways. I really want to emphasize the challenge of decarbonizing heating in particular. Um, this figure taken from a, a, a European report uh, pretty much echoes the story around the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, in 2021, almost half of energy demand for buildings globally was for space heating and water heating. So that's half of the energy consumed by buildings around the world was for Make keeping the temperature constant or increasing it, cooling it, but also for providing warm water. Uh, and in the UK, that is reflected in our energy usage as well. So we've got a real challenge right now because most of the heat that we get comes from fossil fuels still. Uh, and actually a large proportion that isn't from fossil fuels is currently from biomass. And biomass is an incredibly complex topic about how sustainable it, it will it will be in the long term. So we've got a huge challenge. We know we need to tackle decarbonizing heating. We've come an awful long way when it comes to decarbonizing electricity, and there's still more to do there. And Charlotte's mentioned the role geothermal can have, but I'm today going to emphasize the value of heating. If we could go to the next slide, please. So I've borrowed this uh, figure image from uh, the British Geological Survey. Um, and I wanted to just explain what it is we mean by geothermal energy. We're not, when we talk about geothermal energy, talking about the temperature at the Earth's surface, we're talking about the temperature beneath the Earth's surface. There are a number of factors that influence the temperature beneath the ground, uh, not least that actually solar energy warms the ground for us. But that warming effect is very shallow, typically restricted to the top couple of hundred meters. When we talk about shallow geothermal energy and ground source heat, that's an important factor. Once you get below 200 meters and getting deeper beneath the ground, we're into geothermal energy where the temperature beneath the ground is controlled by the rocks and the structure of the solid earth. And there's two ways which heat moves around. Uh, we can have conductive heat transport, that is the heat that's through the grain to grain or the, or the solid parts. So think about a conduction hob, that's a good way to think about this. We can heat a material up or we can have advective transport, which is the movement of fluids. And in different solutions, different technologies, sometimes we're most concerned with how the fluid or the water moves. And in other cases, we're most concerned about the conductive nature of heat transport. So we understand a lot about how heat moves beneath the earth. And what we're really trying to tap into is this almost limitless supply of heat that exists beneath the ground, but to commercialize it, we need to make it economical to extract. And that's why we are really interested, concerned about the transport of heat as opposed to the absolute temperature um, of that. Next slide, please. This uh, image is from uh, ETH Zurich. They have done a wonderful job of demonstrating the diversity in geothermal technologies that can support decarbonizing our energy systems. There's everything from the very shallow uses, which include things like ground source heat pumps. They can include energy piles and thermopiles. This is typically restricted to the upper 500 meters of exploitation. And then there are the deep geothermal projects, this greater than 500 meters, exploiting the, the increased temperature that we experience at depth. 
we, all of this leads to us identifying that this range of solutions means that it's highly scalable. So as well as being low carbon, it's scalable. It means that we can pursue power generation projects at depth, providing low carbon electricity. We can look at individual ground source heat projects for individual industrial sites and everything in between. So that scalability is also extremely valuable. Next slide, please. Across the Northeast, there are principally two types of development which have uh, received the most attention. Uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more later from the other speakers about mine water. So these images from the BGS provide a simplified cartoon of the geology beneath the surface. Uh, and of course, in, in mine water projects, we're looking to exploit the warm water that's maybe at depths of somewhere between 50 or over just over 50 meters in the shallowest seams down to hundreds of meters in the deepest seam and exploit that warm water. In deep geothermal schemes, we're looking to exploit the fluids that we can produce from depths of over 500 meters and down at depths of two, up to two kilometers beneath the surface. And for those of you familiar with Newcastle city center, uh, the, the helix site as it's known now, or, or Science Central as it was known at the time, was the site of a, an, uh, uh, an investigation back in 2010 to look at the potential of by uh, the late Paul Junger uh, and and uh, and others to look at this potential. So we've got the we've taken the initiative across the northeast to look at ways to exploit this huge potential that's beneath us. Next slide, please. We've actually been doing this for quite a while, and we've been collecting this da the data that can help underpin our exploration for much longer than uh, you might be aware. There's four images on, the, on this slide. The far left is a, a legacy uh, coal mine plan that's actually from uh, just north of the border, actually. Um, and we've, of course, got these coal mine workings that are now flooded. The water in them is above ambient. We can utilize that. Much of our early understanding on the temperature distribution from beneath ground came from coal mine workings. Uh, in 1885, there was a publication that showed that we measured the measured temperatures from coal mine workings, and they compiled all of these temperature measurements and highlighted the elevated temperatures that were identified and how those elevated temperatures beneath the surface varied around England and Wales at the time. So we've been collecting data on the temperature beneath the surface of uh, the UK since the late 80, the late 1800s. Fast forward and to the 50s and six, 1950s and 60s, and when geoscience subjects were establishing themselves at Northeast universities, and Sir Kingsley Dunham pictured here postulated the presence of a large granitic rock body beneath the Northeast. He'd subsequently go on to demonstrate the presence of that rock body through Rook, the Rookup borehole, which some of you may have been familiar with. That borehole, which was drilled to demonstrate the presence of a particular rock type for a science project, then became the springboard for the Eastgate geothermal exploration well. And now we see that taking that forward further is the consideration of whether there are lithium rich fluids associated with that geothermal project. So again, another example of the springboard for science and research being the springboard for uh, future opportunities. The Science Central site shown with the drill rig sat in front of St. James's Park. This was and is one of the deepest boreholes drilled within a city area, within an urban area in the UK. It's drilled to almost 1800 meters and it provides a continuous record of the rocks that sit beneath Newcastle city center. It provides an invaluable data point from which we can start to construct and conceptualize models for what the geothermal resource potential might look like. And hopefully, what this all leads to, this ever-increasing 
amount of information and data that we have about the, the geology beneath our feet is it leads to projects coming to life. Like we see on the far right, the image uh, of the, uh, one of the boreholes for the coal, uh, the mine geothermal projects. We want all of this legacy data to be utilized, to be able to build us, build confidence in our interpretations that we can get to a successful geothermal project. Next slide, please. Which takes us to one of the most important concepts, which I think uh, really needs to be emphasized as part of geothermal exploration is there's a real value to the information. If we want to interpret the geology beneath our feet, if we want to interpret down to hundreds of meters for coal mines, we need mine plans. If we want to interpret deeper, we need geophysical data potentially, like this uh, image at the bottom of the screen shows these these. These lines represent the interfaces between different rock units. So we need geophysical data to map out those different rock units that could be potential aquifers that could flow water and produce energy. Uh, and we need calibration data. We need that borehole data that provides us with the confidence that we know exactly what we might find in a given location. So there's a value to information, and it's not just a scientific value to that information. It's an economic value. We can prescribe how important a particular data type is to enable us to make a decision about how best to progress a particular project. Uh, and I really like this quote from uh, Henry Delabesh, who was a, 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 a one of the front runners of geoscience in the in the 1800s. The geological observer will find no difficulty in applying his knowledge to the probability or improbability of obtaining water by means of a well. And that's exactly what we're looking to do to exploit geothermal energy. We're looking to understand how likely it is we think that geothermal energy can provide the energy that we need to help decarbonize a, uh, an, an industry, a city uh, and a country. Next slide, please. We can piece all of this data together to come up with the geological model of what we think the Northeast looks like. And this is really important because once we have these geological models and on the left-hand side is a vertical cross-section through the geology of the Northeast, starting in the North uh, on the left and working to the South on the right-hand side, we can understand the distribution of different rock units and the likelihood that these can help support and deliver that geothermal energy that we we think could provide such value to decarbonize in our energy system. Uh, next slide, please. And why do we need that geological data? Because to make resource estimations, to be able to effectively balance how good does the geothermal heating solution look compared to others, we need that underpinning interpretation. We need to be able to say what we think the geology looks like. Once we have that, we can then model at locations where we know we need to decarbonize heating. So on the left-hand side, areas that are, have a red outline, uh, so uh, around Middlesbrough and Stockton, for example, these are areas of highest heat demand. So we know these areas have high heat demand. We know we need to tackle decarbonizing the heating. If we've got a geological model that can cover these areas, we can then start to think about how much energy we could get from a deep or a shallow geothermal development in any of these cases. The real key is the more geological information we have, the more confident we can be in our interpretation. And right now, a big challenge that we face is that there is a relative sparsity of data across many of our urban areas to make confident interpretations. So in terms of ensuring that we have the right information to make the right business decisions, new data collection is going to be a key part of this going forward. As an example, these, these ones on the slide here uh, are just indicative numbers, but a single deep geothermal development of a production well and an injection well down to two kilometers could uh, possibly meet 20%, uh, maybe 10 to 20% of Middlesbrough's uh, heat and demand in total across that red area. So these are really sizable developments. Uh, 
and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Belinda Humphrey and I'm the Energy Services Manager at Gateshead Council. Apologies if I'm a little bit quirky. I've got a bit of a sore throat. Um, so <laughs> I apologise, uh, but I do. I am paying homage a little bit to Sarah Milligan, the Northeast comedian. So apparently I sound like her when I've got a sore throat. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see the slides at the moment. I think we're just having some technical problems, so yeah. bear with us. <laughs> just bear with us a moment. I think while we're waiting for the slides, I'll start doing my introduction anyway, because the, the first slide is just a picture of the Energy Centre, which I'm sure a lot of people have, have probably seen without even realising it's the big Energy Centre with the big pink tanks outside of it. It's featured on a lot of things to do with heat networks. Um, so as I say, my name is Belinda Humphrey and I'm the Energy Services Manager at Gated Council. Um, I'm here to talk, to talk to you today about our um, learnings with regards to our uh, heat network and our mine water heat scheme, which um, Mark touched on in, in his presentation. And thank you, Mark, your presentation was really interesting to hear the history uh, of geothermal um, energy across across the northeast. Um, if you could just go to the next slide, please, Fraser. Okay, so this is the energy centre I mentioned just a second ago. Um, and my background, as opposed to... Uh, uh, Charlotte and uh, Mark who were just speaking there. My, my background and my uh, aspect of this is, is more bringing people together to deliver these projects. Um, so it's really important in, in projects such as geothermal and anything related to decarbonisation that you have a variety of skills so that we can make things happen. Yes, we need all of the technical information that, that Mark has discussed, <laughs> but we also need the, the people on the ground to, uh, to bring the different aspects together and make these projects deliverable. Um, so I'll be talking about our experience of that in Gateshead. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Gateshead does have a district heat network. Um, for those that are not aware of what district heating is, um, so rather than using gas uh, uh, through the, the current gas pipes, you use heat network, you get you can use a, a variety of sources of heat um, to deliver heat, to provide heat and hot water. To, um, and these are our sites you can see on the red dots on the screen. Our heat network was set up in around 2017-18 um, and delivers to key sites such as um, the glass house on the key side, the Baltic, um, and we recently extended our network right down. So if you follow the blue line, um, the light blue line right down to Gateshead Stadium uh, last year, and that was with the addition of our mine water heat pump, which I'll be talking about today. Next slide, please. So we started a study uh, in around 2020 um, of, we didn't actually start looking at mine water as our heat source. We were looking at different options. Um, and my boss, Jim Gillen, who I'm sure many of you he have heard of, was having a discussion at a conference and somebody from the coal authority said, oh, well, have you thought about all the mines in your area and you could use the heat from those? And that's how, um, how, how our mine water heat scheme was born. Um, so this is a map of the mine workings under Gateshead. Um, so as you can see, we had, we had quite a lot to choose from. Um, now, the tricky part is when you're trying to drill those boreholes that Mark mentioned and showed photos of, you're actually trying to, where the black lines uh, form and, and meet and form across, that's where you're actually trying to uh, hit when you drill a borehole. So you've got to be very sp uh, as specific as you can when you're drilling 150 metres below ground to try and hit the target. Um, which we unfortunately didn't a few times or we didn't get the flow rates. So I think a learning from us from that side is that be prepared that your boreholes may cost you a little bit more um, unless you're the lucky ones in South Tyneside who just went with one borehole and hit target first time. Lucky them, hey. Next slide, please. So pictured here is our, our um, 
Mind what the heat pump centre uh, with Councillor McElroy um, outside of it. I think a really, uh, a really, sorry, another really important part of our scheme is he's having the support of the senior leadership of the council. So the lead, um, both from uh, internal offices, but also from our councillors and political backing as well. We've had the support right through our district heat network from uh, its inception as Gas CHP through to the mine water that we have now. And it's made a real difference um, in being able to get our schemes off the ground and continue to, to deliver these projects, having the backing uh, from the councillors. Um, if we go just to the next slide, please. So as you've seen before, um, we started the study in 2020 and by March 2023, uh, we had our heat pump um, centre built and in operation. Um, so we have two abstraction boreholes and one reinjection borehole. So we abstract from around 150 metres below ground level and we reinject that 40 metres below ground level uh, into, um, we've got the high main seam and the Hutton seam that, that we use. So that's a little bit of the technical information um, for those wondering how deep it is. So it's um, not as deep as some of the um, potential that Mark was discussing, but that is something that we are looking at for future and um, to be able to expand our network further as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide shows our um, solar farms, which also feed into our network. Now these are really important and you may think why are you talking about solar farms on a webinar about geothermal um however these are really important with regards to us decarbonizing our network um so our original network was on gas chp which obviously at the time was quite a good option and um, now we obviously want to decarbonize and take away from uh, move away from the use of gas and um, so we are looking at how we can decarbonize our network and um, we have two solar farms that feed in we've got this one here which you can see is our 2.7 megawatt solar farm we also have a smaller one that's 1.2 just next to gated stadium so delivering a total of four megawatts into our network helping us um to decarbonize where we have because we also have we have a heat and power on our network and um, so it's helping us to decarbonize Sorry, apologies, but my voice is getting croakier and croakier as I go. Um, next slide, please. So with all of these different aspects feeding into our network, we are able to explore something called dynamic purchasing. But dynamic purchasing allows us, so with this really kind of windy, unsummary weather that we've had recently, um, it means that we've been able to purchase um, really cheap power from the grid. So rather than having our uh, gas CHP engines on providing uh, providing the power, um, we've been able to, uh, for our, to run our heat pump, we've been able to purchase um, cheap energy from the grid, um, which has enabled us to decarbonize. And we, for a period of 41 hours last week, we switched our gas engines off completely, um, which is really exciting. And as the grid is turning greener and greener it means that we're going to be able to do this more often so we are slightly reliant on the the grid's um target of being uh, green by 2030 and um, but it means that these days will happen more and more often and we'll be able to decarbonize our network which is really really exciting uh, for so in the meantime we're celebrating our 41 hours and hoping for more days like that to continue even if it does mean we all get blown a little bit about by the wind next slide please so this is another really, uh, really exciting graph that we've been celebrating on the team this past week. Um, so if you have a uh, have a look, at these solid lines show the carbon factor of our heat and power. So the um, kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hours. So as you can see, we've kind of had a bit of up and down, but the overall trend of the lines for the CO2 factor, um, uh, sorry, the carbon factor it is coming down. Uh, the dashed lines show the percentage of our heat and power that is coming from renewables. So our um, our heat pump did originally go live in 2023. So as you can see, we did have a little peak around April to June 2023, and then it came down and then it's gone back up. That was while we were dealing with some snagging issues from our heat pump. Um, but we have had now it in continuous operation since around February 2024. Um, so that trend should just continue upwards which is really exciting as well. Next slide, please. This um, just shows for the geographical layout of our heat network for context for people who are not in the area as well. So you can see our district energy center, which is our original one, is not very far from our mine water heat pump. 
you can see uh, the purple and red labels which show how the, the closeness and the vicinity of our boreholes and they are actually located within the, the solar farm that I showed you previously. Um, and you can just see how close that is as well to the to the quayside and Newcastle just over the water there. Next slide, please. So the first priority for us, like Kate said, um, sorry if you just press the slide again, is the regeneration. So one area that we are currently connecting our heat network to, um, and we had tenants move into these properties in January, a mixed tenure site across private rented social housing and, and owner-occupiers, owner um, is 270 new build homes just off the Felling Bypass um, at Freight Village. It's really exciting for us to be able to say to these residents that the um, water from the mines under the under their feet is being used to heat their homes. And it really sells that story as well to local communities who often have strong connections um, if they have families from uh, pit communities, uh, such as I do. Next slide, please. Also um, on the key side that I just mentioned as well, but on the Gateshead side, there is gonna be the Sage International Conference Center and, and Arena, which should be being built over the next couple of years. Um, and we do have plans in place for they, them to be connected to our uh, heat and power networks as well, which is really exciting and gives us a key anchor load to support the future development of our network and to enable us then to support smaller sites connecting once we have that um, major anchor load connected. I think that's really important as well, looking at regeneration is ensuring that uh, when we're looking at new build sites is that we are prioritising decarbonisation um, and connecting to heat networks rather than looking at the cheapest option. Next slide, please. So uh, our second priority, as I mentioned, is the, is the decarbonisation there. So we do have ongoing offers um, with Tesco's uh, who cover Trinity Square, which is a development in Gateshead, which is a, a shopping centre, uh, as well as student accommodation. Uh, we've got uh, Baltic Place, which is down on the quay side uh, as well. And we're also looking at connect, uh, expanding up Old Durham Road and connecting the, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital to our network as well, which would give us another key anchor load and then support us being able to look at potential expansion into the housing areas around the uh, around the QE. Next slide, please. So our uh, and these priorities, just because this is the third priority, it doesn't in a way make it any less important. I think they all kind of sit uh, as just as important as each other. And this one for me is key communities. We need to ensure that people are on board. District heating is new and in some ways it's as big as the change from uh, coal to gas and, and there's some people who are still struggling with that change now. Um, so looking at uh, district heating and geothermal, it's getting residents on board on board with um, what we're trying to do. So this is a map of um, a low rise uh, social housing estate in Gateshead, which is um, semi detached properties and we have just started a trial um, of connecting 16 properties to our heat network, um, which we believe they're the first people in the UK to be connecting low-rise existing social housing, as most projects focus on um, existing high-rise, new high-rise, or new build low-rise. So these are two-story semi-detached properties. So where you've got the blue line that comes down past the care home, those first 16 properties um, have just been out to site this morning and we'll be starting the work to put the branches into those properties in the next few weeks. So that's given us a really good learning opportunity uh, uh, from that uh, to see how we can engage with residents, get them on board and how, how we can expand that, not just across Gated, but create a project that can be expanded across the UK to provide decarbonisation um, and geothermal opportunities to those who would not necessarily be able to afford other um, options such as air source heat. Next slide, please. As part of this work, um, the important aspect has been engaging with the residents. So you can see the picture on the left um, is us doing some door knocking. I think you can just spot my colleague Matt's orange hat. Um, so we have been door knocking on, on each resident's property to speak to them about the disruption to their homes with regards to... Um, the, the works outside the properties and in their garden, but also the works internally in their home as well, and how we can support them, things like roads being closed and things like that. We also did hold a resident engagement event last week, which was really well attended. As you can see, we've got our, our contractors here explaining the designs and drawings and really taking that technical work that, uh, that Mark mentioned and making it 
um, accessible for those on the street so they can understand not just that they're getting a new heating system, but how exciting and important it is to show where that's coming from. Next slide, please. As I mentioned previously, we are looking at connecting the QE hospital. So if we can make our pilot a reality for, from the 16 homes and expand that to the 550 homes in that estate I just showed you, we believe then that we can expand that um, around the social housing clusters that surround the Queen, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which would be a load of 10,000 homes. We believe then across um, Gateshead, that could be uh, potentially like 15,000 homes as well across the Gateshead borough. Um, so it's we've got big uh, aims and ambitions in Gateshead. Uh, we, we certainly don't, we're not, we're not stopping anytime soon. Um, and we don't just want this to be across Gateshead, not just across the Northeast, but as I say, across the country where we can create a model that other people can follow. Next slide, please. And so as Mark discussed and he showed you um, some drawings and he can talk about it and, and Charlotte in a lot more technical detail than I can, because uh, because my my view is we've got really good rocks under gear set and we're going to explore them. <laughs> and so we do have the potential and we are looking at deep geothermal as an option in Gateshead and, and that may tie in with, with areas such as the QE and um, but these are just at feasibility stage at the moment but we're looking at how we can explore those and and bring further heating potential to the, the Gateshead program. Next slide please. So as I've just mentioned there, this shows the uh, geology underneath Gateshead. Um, I'm not going to um, press too much on this slide, um, but it just shows you the possibilities that we have under Gateshead. And I'm sure that this is reflected not just in our area, but as, as um, others have showed across the northeast and across the country. Next slide, please. So the um, uh, the options for deep geothermal uh, or energy geothermal in the northeast and in Gateshead tie into our zero carbon heat strategy so we can uh, overlay all the maps and information that we've got to tie in uh, where we've got those um, options we can uh, look at the heat loads and map, match them up and really make a difference to local communities uh, with regards to decarbonizing and providing zero carbon heat for residents businesses um, and public and private sector as well Next slide, please. As well as all of the work that I've mentioned already, we were successful in uh, some Innovate UK funding um, with regards to looking at the non-technical barriers around heat networks. And um, so we have three areas that we're focusing on in this, um, and that is uh, resident engagement, so district heat and ready communities. Um, also then looking at district heat and ready supply chains. So ensuring that in the Northeast we have the supply chains available to us to be able to meet the demand that we want to see over the next 10 years with our with our ambitious plans to connect the, those 10,000 uh, 10, homes. Uh, another aspect as well is that we need to look at the legal and financial uh, aspects of Gateshead Energy Company. Apologies as I don't think I touched on this, but our heat network is run by Gateshead Energy Company, which is wholly owned and operated by Gateshead Council. Um, and if we want to increase to the uh, to the scale that I've discussed, and um, we can't rely on government funding where we need to put bids in and things because it, it's just not a consistent supply of funding and we can't provide the reliance for supply chains um, and green skills and jobs. So we really need to look at other legal and financial models and other investment opportunities to see if we can um, deliver the scale and pace that is required for us to meet our net zero targets, but also provide the security um, to contractors and the local uh, communities to deliver what we need. So our ambition, as it says here, is 400 million pounds worth of projects over five to 10 years and drive the skills investment, increase jobs and reduce the install costs and prove the suburban heat network viability, which is the, the pilot in the low rise, uh, low rise housing that I mentioned. Next slide, please. And that is the end for me. You'll be happy to know you don't listen to, need to listen to my quirky voice anymore. But if anybody's got any questions, please pop them in the chat. Hi everyone, it's uh, Chris Smith here. Um, a bit about myself, I, I suppose I'm in charge of 
all things energy and renewable related to the Lanchester Group. So if you're wondering what is the Lanchester Group and, and why are we talking in a, in a geothermal webinar, uh, it's a group of businesses under private ownership of the, of the Cleary family. Um, they include mainly Lanchester Wines, which is wine import and wholesale. We have Greencroft Bottling, which is a contract bottling service. Uh, a gifting business, Spices of Hife, which is based in Gateshead, and um, in a confectionery business down in York called Bonbons. Uh, if you ever go to garden centres, you'll see little packets of sweets. That'll, that'll be ours. Um, so it had humble beginnings. It started off in a living room of Tony and Veronica Cleary in the 1980s, uh, and it's grown to now where we own over a million square foot of warehouse space in, in Durham and in, in Tyneside. And as Mark alluded to earlier, that means there's, a, there's an awful lot of space heating uh, requirements. Uh, so now we've gone from Tony and Veronica to now employing 600 people in the local area. Um, on the bottling side, we bottle around, well, we have capacity to bottle 115,000 bottles of wine an hour, which works out to about 200 million litres of wine a year. Uh, and that's hard to imagine. But it's grown incredibly since the 1980s onwards. Um, a lot of this, if we can just go on the next slide, it's uh, it's oh, next slide again, please. <laughs> ah, the main site here. Yeah. Um, so a lot of this has been pushed around, pushed forward by kind of forward thinking, uh, always a willingness to take risks and, and pioneer different technologies. Uh, so you can see, hopefully, this picture gives you a good example. Uh, this is our new build here in, in Anfield Plain in County Durham. Um, you can see the two 500 kilowatt wind turbines there. Uh, all the black, that's 3.1 megawatts of solar on the roof. So one of the largest solar roofs in, in the UK. Um, we've had air source heat pumps uh, combined with solar since 2008. Um, that's more efficient as in the summer in terms of cooling rather than heating, you know, because solar is a lot better in the summer. Uh, the wind turbines are fantastic in the winter. We get about 70% of our power during the, the darker six months. Uh, so it's kind of it's a good counterbalance to the, to the soil. It works really well in a, in tandem. Um, there's, there's also a whole host of, of kind of sustainable uh, investment going on in the site. You can't see all of it. You can't see that the offices there also have air source heat pumps at the moment. Um, the walls are incredibly well insulated. I don't know if, if many of you know U values. It's kind of a, a measure of air tightness of a building. Uh, and we've gone with 0.12 on the ceilings and walls, which I don't think anybody puts that level of insulation on walls. But to get, it's again to minimize the amount of heating and cooling we need you know, in, in winter and summer. Um, so again, just minimizing the energy cost and, and the carbon cost. Um, future plans for this site in particular, it's where I'm sat right now, is to put a an additional 2.5 megawatt battery there to again just better utilize that solar and wind. Um, so I'm hoping that kind of gives a, an idea of why we've, we've also gone with geothermal heat pumps. So we have a few claims to fame on, in the world of sustainability. We were the first in the UK to, to can wine. Sorry, just reading a message there. Um, so we were the first in the UK to produce canned wine, uh, so aluminium cans. So in theory, endlessly recyclable. Uh, we were the first to do Tetra Pak. I don't know if, if any of you are aware of Tetra Pak, I think like milk bottles, milk cartons, sorry. So we tried that in 2012. I think we were a bit too early on that, it didn't catch on. Uh, we're the first in the UK to do 300 gram glass bottles, uh, which has just launched. Uh, a typical glass bottle is 400 to 500 grams. Again, that just reduces transport fuel, transport carbon. Um, you know, a sparkling glass bottle uh, can be around 800 grams, you know, just to, due to all the pressure of all, of all the fizz. Um, and, and again, as mentioned, with the battery, the soil and the wind, I think we will have the first, at least in the UK, uh, bottling facility and, and wine storage facility that uses a full microgrid. Um, and linking on to geothermal, our claim on the geothermal side is that we were the first in the UK to utilize water from disused coal mines to abstract and put through a heat pump and re-inject back in, into the ground. So our scheme started in 2016. If you can just go on the next slide, please. So this is a, an, an, a slightly outdated diagram, 
But uh, if you can't see it, we do share this on our website, on Manchester Wines website. There's a, a higher quality uh, a version you can zoom in on. So you can see the red abstraction boreholes. We do have a fourth one now around the back of the warehouse, which goes down deeper to 265 meters into the, the Hutton coal seam. And that's where we get 19.1 degree water, whereas earlier at around 150 meters, we were getting around 13 degrees. So just a higher quantity of, of energy, of, of thermal energy that we can put through the heat exchanger and, and put through our warehouse. Um, but the rest of the, the diagram, the discharge boreholes, they're, they're still the same. Uh, so we, we abstract from the Hutton coal seam and discharge into the, the main, the, the high main seam, which I believe are a lot of the same ones that Gates have, have adopted as well. Uh, this is our first heat pump in 2016. Uh, we got the first heat out of it in 2017. Uh, and it, it well, a little bit of heat in 2017, more so in 2018. Uh, and we do have a second one just down the road in our gifting business, Spices of Hythe. These are both in Gateshead, sorry, I should say, just by the um, Gateshead National Sports Stadium. Um, and they use the same core seams again. Um, so this is just, an, I guess, another step on the on the journey to net zero and decarbonizing the business. As, as Peter just mentioned, a lot of the energy that we need in heating a wine storage warehouse is just is just the heat, the heat in the winter. Uh, the northeast of England isn't too isn't too warm, um, and, and these heat pumps have been fantastic. I mean, some some months we get close to a, a COP of six. So for people who don't know, that means for every one unit of electricity we put in, we get on average, over a winter heating period, we get about five or five and a half units of heat out. If you compare that to like a gas boiler or electric heater, you kind of put in one in, one out, and you lose some efficiency to, to sound and light and, and everything else. So incredibly efficient. Um, if you think about a factor of five, five and a half, we're reducing our carbon footprint by that factor of five. Um, so absolutely fantastic at what they do. Um, but being the first to do it in the UK, there has been a raft of challenges. Uh, Belinda mentioned it's not easy hitting that water the first time. We didn't we didn't do it on a, a first attempt. It was quite a few uh, drilling activities. Uh, there's, you know, there's challenges getting that clean connection. There's, there's ensuring you have enough water to put through your heat, your your heat your plate heat exchanger, uh, so you're not kind of drawing down the, the pool. You you, you want to make sure it's infinite. Um, there can be problems with the quality of the water. You know, is it too acidic? How does that interact with your with your plant room? Uh, all the way to you know problems with. Well, this was the first time the regulators were also going through this journey as well. So there's kind of challenges and friction there. Um, uh, but one of the present day challenges that we have is quite a strange one in that we just have too much heat. So. <laughs> If you think we need to keep our wine about above eight degrees, that's where you want wine to be. Otherwise, it throws out a crystal, what they call tartrate. It's a, it's a, if, you, if you do see that in your wine, if you've left it in the fridge too long, it doesn't affect the flavor or the, or the quality of the wine. It's, it's fine to consume. Uh, it's just some people don't like the texture. Uh, but ideally, as a business, we want to keep our warehouses above eight degrees. But we also, like we say, we have a, a gifting business. So we have chocolate, we have cheese. We all go into hampers alongside the wine. Uh, so we don't want it too hot. So we, on average, use about 25% of our heat pump, uh, and the rest is just excess. We, um, we, we're we essentially in a situation where our heat pump trips off because it gets too hot inside the warehouse, uh, which, again, lowers the efficiency. So we do need to look into how we can either kind of join a heat network or create our own heat network. That's just one of our ongoing challenges. Um, ideally, I think going forward, I think I mean Gates had have this done right, and where they are using their their large system as a heat network and heating lo local local communities. Um, but ideally, again, we only use ours for winter heating. We don't really need it in the summer. So right now, ours are both sat offline. Um, so it is better suited, in my opinion, for someone that would need the heat year round, whether it's for manufacturing or processing or just where you need your, your buildings to be a, a higher temperature uh, above, you know, eight to 12 degrees. Um, and and that's, all I, that's all I prepared for for today, if I could pass back to Charlotte, but I am willing to, you know, field questions. 
Thank you very much, Chris. I'll turn my video back in. Again, thank you to all our speakers for some excellent presentations there. I really love that the historical data that was collected over many years is still really valuable today. I think that's great that, you know, people were collecting temperature readings from underground and now we're using that to heat people's homes, let alone the fact they were mining as well. It's just, just brilliant to, to see that. And then obviously thinking about Belinda's project, you can see how key it was that they had the support of the senior leadership and also having worked with them on that project, you know, the risk appetite of the council was brilliant. We were involved from the coal authority side and, and their risk appetite was amazing to consider doing this project and being a, you know, a real trailblazer for a mine heat scheme on a heat network. And having people like Belinda and Jim that really drive this, particularly when local authorities are developing it, is key. And that project is now changing people's lives. Um, I think there's a lady now that will take a shower because she's connected to the heat network, whereas before she couldn't because she didn't want to run her electric shower because it cost her cost her more than using the heat network. So that's making an impact on people's lives. And it's obviously great to see that in the commercial sector, such a strong commitment by Lanchester Wines to becoming a zero carbon organisation. I know that their heat pump system is only one part of the systems that they have and what they offer. So do have a look at their website. They did have a page on there kind of about the sustainability and things. And a good good take home point from Chris there really about your hours of utilisation for these systems. The more you can use it, the more benefits you can um, achieve from it. And especially if you can cascade use it. So maybe um, if you've got a project that's heating homes, after the homes have been heating, the residual heat can then heat a horticulture project. After that, you could heat an aquaculture project. This kind of cascade use and anything that increases the utilisation is really good for the economics. So please do um, put your questions into the Q&A boxes and we'll work through those. To start with, I've got a question for uh, each panel member. So, Mark, I was going to come to you first um, and just ask you, what do you think is the role of universities in progressing deep and shallow geothermal and, and mine water projects? Uh, I think, um, well, universities pl play a lot of different roles. So one of the mo import most important roles that universities serve is they provide education. Um, so we're training those that are going to solve the problems that we have in the future. So if we see that geothermal energy is going to be key, training the next generation of hydrogeologists, heat pump engineers, designing next generation materials, these are all invaluable degree programs that are going to you know support that so we've got a role in education uh of course research we've seen there's loads of examples of where a small piece of finding from a particular science area provides just enough of a springboard to catalyze someone else to go and do something so that important relationship between the private sector and renus universities to use a our expertise that we have across to problem solve little things and provide a catalyst that perhaps changes the economics just enough that tips it to be better than the alternative. Those are the two key places. And, and then, of course, I think all the universities, but particularly Newcastle, we've got a civic role. So we want to play a global role and have impact, but we want to be a civic university. We want to be able to support the, the priorities of the region as well. And, you know, if we can play our role in helping decarbonize heating, cooling and power through our expertise, that's what's important for us too. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's really good the way you're unconstrained in some ways at a university. I'm speaking this personal experience when I was working at one and I started looking at mine heat 20 years ago and everybody was like, go away, we've got cheap gas, it's going to be too expensive, it'll never work. And then 20 years later, I was absolutely delighted to be involved in the Gateshead scheme. So um, it pays to be persistent, but I think it, do, it does give you that opportunity to explore ideas which may not be initially economic or make a lot of sense for some metrics. But you have that freedom, don't you, to explore it. And as you say, that conversation sparking with someone else can then be the start of something really good. So thank you for that. Belinda? In your experience, and I do feel a bit guilty asking your questions with such a sore throat, so please do, <laughs> if you need to provide a very short answer, please do, or would prefer, you know, to answer the questions in the chat, let me know, we can sort that out. But 
Um, in your experience, how did you achieve the balance of working with other stakeholders and across all the sectors with delivering a viable and successful project? I know you had, for example, a lot of contractors involved and, and you're working with ourselves when I was at the Coal Authority as well. So how did that work out in practice? So yeah, my, my sore throat sounds a lot worse than what it is, so it, it doesn't actually hurt, it just sounds, and I'm annoying myself how I sound, so apologies to everybody else. Um, but I think, to be honest, I think the key thing, I think as a council, we are in the best position to be able to bring all of those different parties together to deliver projects such as this, um, because we are involved in the private sector, the public sector, the land ownership, um, uh, get liaising with businesses liaising with local providers such as colleges and things like that um so we, i think we are in the best position and it's having those people um who are really good at stakeholder management to bring those people together um and i think having everybody on the same page has been really important i think a key learning for me is we have a lot of project meetings where everybody gets together so you're not kind of like oh the call authority right you must come and speak to us and then we'll speak to the consultant we very much had very open meetings um across the different parties and i think that's really important because things can easily get um lost in translation and um, so if you have um obviously you need to have your contracts and everything in place and there's some meetings you may have separately but i think the key thing for me is to having kind of that open book and relying on the skills of those around you so as a council and as a project team we don't have all of the technical knowledge that we need but um people such as the coal authority yourself Charlotte, obviously you are key to the key to the project and um, the drilling company they've each got the skills and expertise that you need to bring to the project and you're not going to get that from one party and um, you need to bring that expertise together around the table so i think that that's the key for me is kind of not thinking that you're going to have all the answers to deliver it um and kind of let your ego go a little bit and and rely on the expertise of those people around you. Yeah, and that collaborative approach is key. And I, I have no problem asking anybody all manner of daft questions over the years. I'd strongly advocate it to anybody. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's that collaborative approach is definitely key. And obviously it's something we want to promote at the centre, but it is, yeah, it's, I think it's real, real uh, kind of credit to you all involved in the project. Chris, in terms of your project, um, obviously yours was an exemplar for, for companies basically looking to invest in mine heat projects. And, you know, I've spoken to people about it over the years and some people didn't even know what you were doing there. Um, so how do you think you can get more people? Have you had people asking you how, how you did it and can we do it? Um, and... Do you think what do you think is needed for more private sector organisations to explore deep geothermal and mine water projects as well? Well, there's definitely interest. We've done a, quite a few uh, tours of the site, um, so there is interest out there. Uh, I suppose our our initial challenges that would I suppose be barriers for entry were around the the limited experience and knowledge just in the industry as as a whole. Uh, and obviously, that's where your centre would, would come in in that kind of main blend with another scheme sharing lessons learned and, and best practice because I'm sure there's a, there's a lot to share between us all um, other than that I, I suppose it was again it was a bit of a challenge early early days working with regulators so just kind of getting the regulation and policies in place to make it just more of a smoother transition away from fossil fuels uh, and then finally I, I hate to say it but this is the financial side um, I mean, grant funding goes a long way if, for, to help a, a private business or if there's something such as bringing back the renewable heating centres, that would, uh, again, go a long way to, to decarbonise heating across the UK. Great, right, thank you very much. Hmm. And I guess anybody that's interested can contact you as well to, oh, to get some advice. Yeah, yeah it's definitely. great. So I'll get some of the questions that we've had submitted on the chat now. Um, there was one specific to NGC, so I'll answer that one quickly now, asking what type of activities do we plan to fund in future and when do we expect to be in a position to invite funding bids? And that is the million dollar question, quite literally. Um, in terms of activities that we would like to fund, they will come out of consultation with our stakeholders in the workshops that are coming forward. So part of that 
talking about gaps and how we fill them, it, we may realise that work needs to be done. Um, and that's when we would then think of, attack, you know, what, what type of activity is needed to be funded here. And that might be something from um, like a, an SME that's developed a particular gadget that can help with drilling. It could be research that we could then ask the academics to work on. It could be an industry problem that the industry have set to researchers. It could be something on policy. So I think it's a very broad range of activities identified by needs from, from stakeholders. And when we expect to be in a position, I mean, the centre aims to be self-sustaining within two years. If we can get some seed funding, we could probably start having some smaller technology calls um, before then. But that's probably the timescales we're looking at because we've literally just started in January and I've only been with the organisation three months. So it's very early days, but we're having a lot of good conversations. Um, OK, just scrolling through the chat to pick up the next question. So there's a question here and I don't know whether um, maybe Belinda or Chris might have had some experience of this. It's about land ownership and does it allow for continental assistance for insurance? underwriting work and I'm not sure whether this means whether you've got drillers coming from elsewhere or um yeah or whether it's kind of investments from outside the UK um but I don't I know that some people that we've talked to have uh, had issues with land ownership in general and that is certainly something that we want to address in terms of our um kind of policy groups that we all have in our workshops, but I don't know, Belinda or Chris or, or Mark as well, do any of you have anything to add on that point? Well, for me, that would be one I would have to take away, I'm afraid. Just yeah. Uh, yeah, speak what yeah. our experience has been on that. Because I, I do know we did get some assistance from overseas on the initial drilling project. I believe it was an Icelandic team early days. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I would have to take that one away. Yeah, and I, I think... Um, I think it's certainly something that I would think about asking when we're talking about this as well, because I hadn't really thought about that before. So thank you for flagging it. I don't, did you want to come in there, Belinda? Did you have anything? No, I was going to say I didn't have anything further to add, but I could take the question away. The drilling company yeah. that we used were um, a local company, so I'm, I'm not sure if I had anything further to add on this. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we'll all be taking that one away. So really good question. Thank you. Um. So there's a question here about abstraction of the water, which, of course, is the energy carrier for geothermal. So abstraction takes a lot of energy um, and injection even more. Does this limit, limit the benefits of geothermal? Um, I guess this might be one for to start with you, Chris, and then Belinda and Mark afterwards. Yeah, yeah well, well, in our experience, um, I don't know if it's just because of the scale of our, of our project, it doesn't really have a major impact. Perhaps if you just see it in a single home, that, that motor becomes a, a larger kind of proportion of the whole system, but for us, very small. Um, maybe maybe on the on the decimal scale in terms of the COP that we get back. It's not a large proportion. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think for us, obviously, yes, it does require a lot of a lot of energy. Um, but I think that's where the key is if you've got the key anchor loads. Um housing uh, is a lot more difficult to stack up uh, as a as a commercial viability for, for things like heat networks. You do need key anchor loads to to make the case work for district heat networks, um, such as sites um, that will use continuous uh, heat loads, such as the hospital um, or manufacturing um, and things like that. So that's where like our future plans we do need to have kind of key sites connecting to then allow us to then fund smaller sites such as schools community centers um maybe other local smaller businesses and things like that so it is ensuring that you do have those key anchor loads because as well the other issue that you've got is as chris mentioned they don't use their their heat pump in the summer because they don't have the heat demand and um, a lot of homes are not going to use heat in the summer but if you've got um areas where they use uh, heat all year round and you have that higher anchor load um, then that makes your commercial viability a lot better thank you just maybe yeah. just want to add in of course it's all it's, it's it's a scalable problem right so if we're talking about abstracting water from 150 meters deep the amount of pump power required to 
lift that water is much less than if we're trying to lift the water from two kilometers but then of course you're trading that off with that you might get water that's 60 or 70 degrees and not need the temperature boost once you get it to the surface so you've got actually lots of it's not just a geological problem it's kind of an integrated geology engineering problem to optimize the system design for the load that you've got which is why it can't be here's the geology and we'll figure out the demand side afterwards it's got to be absolutely integrated to come up with a solution so you optimize the cop effectively for the for the solution you're looking at and there has to be a balance doesn't there between the kind of capex and opex as well so you are you going to pay a bit more longer term or are you going to pay a bit more upfront and and how is that going to work i mean as an example for the coal authority projects we built a very simple model and um, if the mine water level was more than 100 metres below surface, you were maybe spending a little bit more on electricity than you would need to to make it efficient, unless you had access to wind or solar. That was kind of a, a rule of thumb that we used that might be helpful. Next question. Um, for Mark, have you done much work on ATEFs for cooling? Uh, not, a, not a lot of... Uh, used in aqua for thermal storage for cooling, but I think um, I guess I've seen the question in the chat. Uh, aqua for thermal energy is actually quite widely deployed, although often unknowingly. So there's a number of schemes across in London, for example, where thermal energy storage is is really common. I think you're always looking to again when you're looking for a cooling solution, something like aqua for thermal storage requires an integrated heating and cooling system in your building to really get the benefits from using a, a, a subsurface solution for cooling if you currently at the surface infrastructure got a separate heating loop and a separate cooling loop it becomes you know very complicated so i i suspect the short answer is that if you've got a new project or a project that's already got an integrated heating cooling system then looking at thermal energy storage as a as a way to solve this is really good. I think if you've got a, a legacy system that's got separate loops, it's much more challenging. Okay, thank you. I don't know if Belinda or Chris have anything to come in on thermal energy storage. I know your schemes don't involve that at the moment. It, I know there are people in Germany working on thermal energy storage for mine heat projects. So that is something that um, we're looking at also in the UK as well. I know Edinburgh University are looking at something. Um, there's a few projects on that. Um, I'll move on to the next question. There's a question here about, do you think hydraulic fracturing uh, re is, re is realistic technology option in Northeast area for onshore geothermal developments? Um, it's probably worth coming to you. I mean, obviously I've got a view on this, Mark, but I don't want to hog it. So I'll, I'll let you, because you've done the broader work on this um, um, on the panel. Yeah, so um, for those that aren't familiar, hydraulic fracturing basically is a way that we it look to improve the flow rate that we can get from any rock formation by purposely fracturing the rock and creating new flow pathways. Uh, it's stemmed out of onshore oil and gas in North America. Um, in my view, uh, and from the data that I've seen, there are enough what I would call conventional flow units that we don't need to look at options to stimulate and fracture the rocks to promote flow right now. I mean, that's not to say that there aren't technology solutions that could deliver this, but whether we need those solutions for our demand side is a completely, it, it is not clear to me. I think we've got a diversity of resources across ground source heat pumps, coal mine geothermal, conventional deep geothermal, and flow through naturally fractured rocks in things like granite uh, akin to the Cornwall projects that actually we've got four to five different resource types without even considering um, more challenging both technically and with a public perception and a risk perception angle uh, hydraulic fracturing. Yeah I would agree with you that I think it's all about with the economics of geothermal it's a low-hanging fruit so why would you do something more complicated or potentially that is going to be more difficult to get through planning or something or get the approvals for. Thank you. Um, so 
I've got a question for you, Belinda. Obviously, you've talked about your project, which is in Gateshead, and um, an amazing exemplar of serving the heating needs of a wide range of users. But if you've got somebody sitting in a rural areas, um, what's the what's the risk of social exclusion if they're sitting there? You know, I want this, but I'm not in a big, you know, <laughs> town. How can I have it? Yeah, and I, I completely agree there is a risk of that. And unfortunately, heat networks are not going to reach everybody in every situation. However, you have got the, in a lot of rural areas is where the, the mine workings are going to be that could be tapped into. So there is a lot of potential in looking at things. Um, and I, I've had discussions in the past talking about things like massive kind of greenhouses that could be created to then provide um, sustainable communities if they can... Um, grow their own vegetables and things that wouldn't normally be able to be grown uh, in this country, for example, we're then reducing our reliance on um, importing those fruits and vegetables and reducing um, kind of obviously the carbon impacts of that and providing um, they are, sorry, I can't think of the word, but they they don't need to rely on other people uh, on other areas. So they're more 